Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. As uh, we start this session, we're going to go to the book of First Timothy. We've been working through these little books, going through the Bible. We're getting very close to the end. But let's go to the book of First Timothy, to the third chapter. And let's start reading with the first verse. And uh, try not to get discouraged as we read through this. <laughs> this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Uh, anybody up for being a bishop? <laughs> well, of course, um, the the word bishop there is taken from Catholic terminology. Uh, it just means a church leader. And um, I think if we held very strictly to those criteria, there wouldn't be too many church leaders left. Um, this day and age. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a difficult thing. Well, that introduces our section to First and Second Timothy. And let's talk just a little bit about the background of this book, uh, these two books. Actually, we're going to get over to two books, uh, hopefully in the next couple of sessions. Um, Paul, which we're all familiar with, hopefully, is now writing to his young uh, co-worker, Timothy, when he went to, when he traveled on his first missionary journey up to the middle of what we would today call Turkey, about the year 46 A.D., he first met Timothy and his mother and his grandmother who were Jewish. Um, his father was Greek. And uh, apparently Timothy was impressed by Paul. And the next time Paul came through, Timothy says, I want to join you. And so it probably in 49 AD, um, as he came through, he said, okay, Timothy, I want you to join me, I admit. But he did something unusual for Paul. What was that? Remember? Circumcised. He had him too in prison. He's, he, arrayed, he said, Timothy, if you're going to work with me, you need to be circumcised. I thought Paul was against circumcision. <laughs> what happened? Double standard. <laughs> Double standard for church leaders. That's right. Yes. Well, but that wasn't the real reason. Why did he really have Timothy circumcised? Probably didn't want it to be a sticking point with the among the Jews. Because what was Paul's plan of work? Every new city he went to, the first place he went to evangelize was the Jewish synagogue. And he says, Timothy, if you're going to work with me closely and you're going to do that part of the work, you've got to be circumcised. The Jews will just have a fit if you try to come into their, their synagogue when you're not circumcised, and this is not going to work. But a uh, Gentile coming in, he said, no. That's right. Double well, standard. It, well, situation it ethic. It depends. It depends on who you're planning to work with. Perhaps. He, he, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, perhaps this is bad phraseology here, mm -hmm. but when in Rome, do as the Romans do. 
So he just wanted to make sure that if yeah. anyone said, you know, are, are you okay? I remember one time uh, uh, my family has had a lot of contact in the Jewish community. My father was a Gentile, if you will, from the Jewish standpoint, but they needed someone to help them with some ceremony. And at the last moment, they, one of the ladies came up and said, you are circumcised though, right? So he was, so everything proceeded on. So maybe, maybe that was Paul's idea, yeah. not to cause any trouble. Well, you remember, there was a big argument and a fight down in Jerusalem over that issue. And Paul came out clear at that point in time. He took Titus with him. We'll talk about Titus a little bit later. And he says, no way, you're not going to circumcise this guy. And they didn't. And he didn't allow it. But this time he said, Timothy, I'm going to want you to help me work with the Jewish population. You need to be circumcised. And so he did. Well, then Timothy went on to work with him through his first missionary journey. They went up to Macedonia, worked for a while, had all those problems and so forth. They called over. He was called on, over to Macedonia, remember, by that vision. Went down to Corinth. They worked together for a long time there. And then we don't know exactly if Timothy was with him the whole time or Timothy traveled around doing things at Paul's command. But basically, we should say that Timothy was largely associated with Paul for the rest of Paul's life. Okay. So what happened about AD 61, uh, or actually 58, I guess we need to stop there. You remember that uh, Paul was arrested, AD 57, 58 probably. Uh, Paul was arrested in Jerusalem and taken to prison in Caesarea. Uh, we don't know what happened to Timothy or Luke or some of the others that were with Paul on a regular basis at that point. But a little while later, a couple years later, when he's on, off to Rome, some of these people were with him. And Timothy was with him sometimes in Rome. We don't know exactly how much. Uh, it says in Philippians 1, 1 and 26 and 2, 19 and 24, and possibly Hebrews 13, 23, that Timothy was with him there in Rome. Then in, in, in 64, um, some point at that, in 64, 65, maybe into 66, Paul was granted freedom again for a period of time, and he worked very closely with Timothy during that time, and it was during that period of freedom between these two imprisonments in Rome that the first book of Timothy was written. So that's the context. Paul is free from prison. He's been in prison for several years, four years at least, two in Caesarea and two in Rome, up to before this time. And we know that shortly he's going to be arrested and sent back to Rome again. And he calls, well, we're going to find out that Paul continues to write to Timothy even in, during his second imprisonment. That's a little bit of the, of the background. Now, there are scholars, critical scholars, who have serious questions about these pastoral epistles. The pastoral epistles are First and Second Timothy and Titus, and some would include Philemon, but that's not usually included. Um, and there's some people who have serious questions about these books because they don't fit into anywhere in the book of Acts. And why is that? They're pastoral. Some think well, that they're after the book of Acts. They almost certainly, well, we know they happened after the book of Acts closed. We don't know whether Dr. Luke was planning to write a volume three. Probably so, I would guess. But uh, volume three, if it was ever started, was never, never finished. We never got it. He wrote the Gospel of Luke, then he wrote the book of Acts, and then whatever was supposed to come after that never happened or was destroyed or lost or whatever. Um, so, but there's, there's no reason for us to question about that. Uh, there were, there are um, ancient, ancient, ancient church leaders who were writing about these books and treating them as if they were inspired within 50 to 100 years after um, they were written and naming them by name. People like Clement of Rome and Ignatius and Polycarp. So uh, we shouldn't be... There's no reason to have any questions about the fact that Paul wrote these books and that they're inspired and that they're reliable. And, uh, and could it be said that perhaps because Timothy had been working with Paul for about 20 years, 
I don't know, perhaps some of these letters was just to kind of give some authority to Timothy so Timothy could say, this is what it is. See, Paul says here, because Timothy, it seems, should have already known a lot of this. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and and, and the, these, these two books from, from Paul to Timothy talk a lot about church discipline, about church organization, about dealing with church leaders and so forth. And all that stuff seems to people to be quite a ways down the line after the very early church developments, which, which it is. Uh, it's later in Paul's life. And so, uh, but we shouldn't have a problem with that at all. Um, I thought there was one interesting comment I ran across. There was an ad some years ago, men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. Would you respond to an ad, to an ad like that? Looking for a job? Well, that advertisement appeared in a London newspaper and thousands of men responded. Why? Because it was signed by Sir Ernest Shackleton. And of course, he was headed for the poll. So a lot of people responded. What do you suppose if uh, somebody had written an advertisement or an ad like that for church leaders in the first century in Paul's day? Well, I thought that's what you were referring to. Yeah. Actually, yes. Yes, men and women wanted for a difficult task of helping to build my church. You will often be misunderstood, even by those working with you. You will face constant attack from an invisible enemy. You may not see the results of your labor, and your full reward will not come until after all your work is completed. It may cost you your home, your ambitions, even your life. So that's the kind of things we're talking about here in, in the days of Timothy. What do we know about that brief period of freedom, maybe a couple years, uh, between the first and second imprisonment of Paul? Well, it's hard to know for sure, but if you try to put all the pieces together, it looks like, Paul, I'm just going to take you there real quick. If you have a map, maybe at the back of your Bible, you might want to look at it. He probably went to Crete first, then he went headed for Macedonia, and probably on the way he passed through Asia Minor, and probably visited Miletus and Ephesus on that process. And he was in the process of sending people here and there to do tasks all the time. And if he was in Ephesus, he almost certainly would have gone a short distance uh, up the river to, to uh, Colossae, say Laodicea and Hierapolis, probably spoke to the people there. Then going on to, Asia, to Macedonia, as we suggested, he no doubt went to Philippi because he had promised the Philippians that he was going to come there. From there, he probably went down to Nicopolis, which is uh, on the coast there. Um, possibly, and, and while he was there, he sent uh, Tychicus back to Crete um, and uh, left Erastus. Well, he went down to Corinth, left Erastus at Corinth. He went back to Troas uh, for whatever reason. We don't know exactly. Maybe he saw there was a need to spread the gospel there. And it was at Troas that Paul was rearrested and taken to Rome in his final imprisonment. Um, now, let's just talk a little bit about how things had played out. Um, Paul was released from prison sometime early in AD 64. A few months later, what happened? Anybody know, got their timetable fitted out exactly? Only a few months after that, was the, was the time when Nero burned almost half of Rome. And there was no question about it. A lot of people knew that Nero was responsible. But of course, he, 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 he wasn't about to take responsibility for what he had done and, and possibly end up with some problems himself. So what did he do? Blame the Christians. He started blaming Christians. And literally thousands of Christians in Rome, many of whom may have become Christians because Paul had, remember during his first imprisonment, he was allowed to hire his own house, and he was under kind of house arrest, chained to a Roman guard, but anybody who wanted to, to could come and visit him and, and so forth, and so he had done a lot to build up the church. He even had um, followers, you know, that he converted to Christianity that were in the emperor's household. Yes, among the emperor's elite guard and so forth, and <coughs> they didn't leave their jobs. They stayed on their jobs. Um, 
despite the fact that they had become Christians. Can you imagine a more unhealthy place for a Christian? It gives me uh, goosebumps thinking about all the good work that Paul did. Yeah. But how did Nero, how, how did he burn the city? How did he burn Rome? Did, did he have guys in black go around? Uh, I don't, I don't know. I, that's a good question. I, I haven't looked that up to see exactly how it was done, the, the, the actual mechanism. Because whatever he did, it wasn't really clear who did it, was it? Well, they, there were plenty of people who knew for sure who did it. Yeah, yeah. But, but it wasn't clear enough to no. keep that rumor from... Well, but remember, spreading. Nero was also claimed to be a god. Mm -hmm. And there are actually people who believed that he was a god. So, you know, you try to accuse him of something, you, you can't, you, you're not going to get away with that. They're going to they're turn it around and say, no, God said, da-da-da. So do you think that he uh, had a purposeful intent, like to cause specifically harm to the Christians? Or do you think that he was just completely insane and... Well, I mean, why he started the fire or why he right, blamed the Christians? Fire. Yeah. No, I, 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 if, it's my understanding that he started the fire because he, he, some of the people who had property in some places wouldn't let him take over the property he wanted to take over. Mm -hmm. And then he was, later he was able to build in that whole area, well, there, the marketplace area as He did well quite a that. bit of stuff there, but yeah, he, hmm. you know, that, it, was, it was an awful thing. But he, then he started... Uh, uh, blaming the Christians, and finally, he, the Jews. Remember, Nero's second wife was an apostate Jew. And after blaming the Christians and destroying literally thousands of Christians in Rome, um, he, the Jews came to hit, probably working through his second wife, and said, "We want, we want, we, we." And they came up with some kind of plausible whatever and wanted to blame Paul as being the primary instigator. Well, of course, I mean, as soon as that sort of stuff starts going around, Paul was arrested and, and taken, even though no one had found him guilty of anything. He so was arrested this is, and taken back to Rome. So perhaps some of the Christians, I remember one time you'd mentioned he had a lot of trouble within the church, Paul did. So yeah. maybe today we can even have some trouble from our own brothers and sisters. Well, yeah, Paul had various kinds of problems, yes. We'll, we'll talk more about that. We've already, you know, Norm read us the passage from 1 Timothy 3 that would say that none of us qualify to be church leaders, basically. Um, let me just read a few words. These are from, um, well, let me read a couple things about Paul's death. We're going to work toward that. We'll probably get there in our session for next week. But early Christian tradition tells us that Paul was condemned and executed, probably beheaded, almost certainly beheaded, along the Appian Way, where his tomb was still standing in the second century. Tacitus, the Roman historian, tells us about the great fire in Rome, said to be caused by Nero himself, who reigned from 8, uh, 13 October 19, uh, AD 54 to 9 Ju June 1860. I keep wanting to say 18, A.D. 68, and then on, on, that fire was on July 19 of A.D. 64. As a result, Nero laid the blame upon the Christians and began a persecution that extended throughout the empire by making, a, making it a criminal offense to proclaim the Christian faith. It is possible that Paul was arrested as a result of Nero's decree and brought back to Rome to suffer martyrdom. Eusebius places the death of Peter and Paul in the 13th year of Nero, which would be A.D. 67, while Jerome places it in the 14th year, which would be A.D. 68. And those are, those are quotations from um, sources that, quote, in turn, quote, from the early church fathers. And one other thing I want to read before we start, take up some of the challenging issues. This is a note, the introduction to these books from the Message Bible. Christians are quite serious in believing that when the, they gather together for worship and work, God is present and sovereign really present and absolutely sovereign. God creates and guides. God saves and heals. God corrects and blesses. God calls and judges. With such comprehensive and personal leadership from God, what is the place of human leadership? Quite obviously, it has to be second place. It must not elbow its way to the front. It must not bossily take over. Ego-centered, 
ego prominent leadership betrays the master. The best leadership in spiritual communities formed in the name of Jesus, the Messiah, is inconspicuous, not calling attention to itself, but not sacrificing anything in the way of conviction and firmness either. In his letters to two young associates, Timothy and Ephesus and Titus and Crete, we see Paul encouraging and guiding the development of just such leadership. What he had learned so thoroughly himself, he was now passing on and showing them, in turn, how to develop a similar leadership in local congregations. This is essential reading, because ill-directed and badly formed spiritual leadership causes much damage in souls. Paul, in both his letter and his letter, his life and his letters, shows us how to do it right. So, um, what were some of the problems that Timothy had? Just let's just start from First Timothy chapter one. Let me just read a few verses. Paul speaking to Timothy in verse three. I want you to stay in Ephesus just as I urged you when I was on my way to Macedonia. Some people there are teaching false doctrines, and you must order them to stop. Okay, that was the first problem he had to deal with. Tell them to give up those legends and those long lists of ancestors which only produce arguments. There's another thing he had to deal with. They do not serve God's plan, which is known by faith. The purpose of this order is to arouse the love that comes from a pure heart. It's another challenge. <clears throat> a clear conscience and a genuine faith. Some people have turned away from these and have lost their way in foolish discussions. They want to be teachers of God's law, but they do not understand their own words or the matters about which they speak with so much confidence. So, what, what kind of, what, what, what is that describing those last few words there? Kind of arrogant. <clears throat> um, ignorant teachers. Yes. Yeah. Well, not exactly. They don't think they're ignorant. They think that they're oh, very, no. very sure. wise and they know what they're talking about, but they don't. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why I call them ignorant. <laughs> well, I was talking about their point of view, yeah. not yours. <laughs> okay. Well, look at verses 8 to 11. There's a very significant passage there that we probably ought to use a lot more than we do. We know that the law is good if it is used as it should be used. It must be remembered, of course, that laws are made not for good people, but for lawbreakers and criminals. What's the purpose of law? To reign in lawbreakers and criminals, right? For the godless and sinful, for those who are not religious or spiritual, for those who kill their fathers and mothers for murderers, for the immoral, for sexual perverts, for kidnappers, for those who lie and give false testimony, or who do anything else contrary to sound doctrine. That teaching is found in the gospel it was entrusted to me to announce the good news from the glorious and blessed God. Um, what do we think is the purpose of a law? <laughs> it's, it's, for the, it's for the people that need guidance, <laughs> not the people that don't. And correction. Law is to point out sin. Okay. And then you run to Christ for the will and the power to overcome. Quite a while earlier, when writing to the Galatians, Paul suggested that um, some law was added. Would that fit with what we're reading right here? Yes. What law was added? We don't want to go back and rediscuss Galatians 3, but... All law. Basically all law. Okay. In other words, at a time when there were no sinners, if you want to go back to heaven before the sin entered, or even to the Garden of Eden before they sinned, did you need law? Yeah, you don't need to bring it up if nobody's doing wrong. Yeah. You're not stealing. What do you need to make a law not to steal or not yeah. murder? I mean, there's no, nobody has the desire to kill anybody. Nobody wants to take something that doesn't belong to them. Why do you need to make a law? Yeah. So basically, the law is a description of how you will live if you're in harmony with the way creation was meant to operate. Which means, who is it that's out of line? The, the lawbreakers. Yeah. yeah. The people who want to destroy themselves and everybody around them, for that matter. It's kind of, it's kind of a twist, though, in the meaning here, because we, we know that the law has always been here, right? Well, gravity has always been there. It has here. always been, well, I'm not talking about physical stuff. I'm talking about the law, character of God has always been here. Uh -huh. But yet, at the same time, he says it was added. It was just like saying God's character was added. 
but but you don't look at it that way. So you have to be careful on what you understand what he's talking about here. The reason the reason it says it was added is because we needed it. Now, if we if we were all happily living in accordance with God's law, well, or let's say in accordance with His character, we wouldn't need law. It was added, and and this is very clear that. The Ten Commandments as we know them, if we just take that as an example, are relevant only to human beings. Angels are, there are no male and female angels. What would, the, what would it say to, what would it mean to an angel, don't commit adultery? Doesn't make any sense. We can't tell an angel, we'll keep the seventh day Sabbath. The only place there's seventh day as we know it is here on planet Earth. So the Ten Commandments and all the other laws as far as we know in, in the Bible as we have it, were adapted for human beings. Now, sure, it's based on God's character, but they were adapted for human beings. That's what the adding is talking about. How about it was written down? <coughs> because you don't, if, if it was, you don't even need to think of it in, a, in, in your mind until something's going wrong, and then you write something down. Now, okay, don't do this, don't yeah. do that. But until that happens, you don't need to write it down. So, so it was adding. It's always been here, but it <coughs> hasn't always been codified. There you go. Word. So it's the way things work. Mm -hmm. Desire of Ages, page 608. Mm -hmm. The law points out man's duty and shows him his guilt. To Christ, he must look for pardon and power to do what the law enjoins. Mm -hmm. Okay. Old words. Let me um, quote you a passage from Ellen White also. Mount of Blessing, page 109. In heaven, service is not rendered in the spirit of legality, because you have to, we might add. When Satan rebelled against the law of Jehovah, the thought that there was a law came to the angels almost as an awakening to something unthought of. In their ministry, the angels are not as servants, but as sons. There is perfect unity between them and their creator. Obedience is to them no drudgery, and so forth. There's another passage that you might want to look at if you have time, and that's found in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 364. Um, maybe I should just read that since we've had this brief discussion. If man had kept the law of God as given to Adam after his fall, preserved by Noah and observed by Abraham. So this is reaching way back, suggesting there was law all the way back in the Garden of Eden, huh? There would have been no necessity for the ordinance of circumcision. So why was the ordinance of circumcision necessary? Adam, Noah, Abraham, their descendants weren't obeying the law, right? And if the descendants of Abraham had kept the covenant of which circumcision was a sign, they would never have been, sedu they would never have been seduced into idolatry, nor would it have been necessary for them to suffer a life of bondage in Egypt. They would have kept God's law in mind and there would have been no necessity for it to be proclaimed from Sinai or engraved upon the tables of stone. Incredible. If they had learned what they were supposed to learn from circumcision, all that would not have been necessary. And had the people practiced the principles of the Ten Commandments, there would have been no need of the additional directions given to Moses. It's That's about hard to understand. <laughs> really? Yeah, it is. It really is. It's hard for me to understand that. Yeah. Well, it's about time for our break. Think about it for a moment as, as we take a break. Why would God come down and give law at that point in time? What do you think was the purpose of it? And would it be, is it still necessary today?
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay by. We were talking about why law was given. We noticed in the writings of Paul to Timothy, first of all, that the purpose of law is to hopefully reign in sin by, you know, condemning lawbreakers and commandment makers and so forth like that. But then we also noticed that for those who keep God's law naturally, those who want to be more like God and are earnestly seeking how they can better follow the example of Jesus, the law may eventually not be necessary at all. They will do right because it is right. Well, Paul has some other very interesting things to say about what we would consider to be issues in the great controversy. Look at 1 Timothy 1, verse 20. This is a really unusual statement. It's talking about some people who had not listened and to the faith and they had, they had been pretend, pretended to be Christians and then they had rebelled. And it says, Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have punished by handing them over to the power of Satan. This will teach them to stop their blasphemy. Whoa! It's kind of like what God did with the children of Israel with Babylon, perhaps. Uh -huh. You know, let them come in and whip you around for a while, maybe for 70 years. And that was God withdrawing his protection. Yeah. Yeah. What, what did he think would happen to him if God, if you left him alone? What did I mean, Paul think or what did who think? I mean, what, would he th what, what did he think would happen to him? To, the, the to these two people. To these two people if that was carried out. Well, he, he said they were supposed to carry it out. And, and so what, what was, what did, I mean, your question is correct. He, he basically said, throw them out of the church. Hopefully, that response, that action, will help them wake up and realize their mistakes. He was trying to teach them, according yeah. to the text here, is trying, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Yeah. It's kind of hard to know exactly what would happen to them to make them possibly come back. Mm -hmm. Whether it was just, you know, just being put out where you, you're away from everybody now, or if there was really some protection that would be taken away and they would get it somehow. And, and uh, Hymenaeus, we learn later, mm -hmm. he was saying that the resurrection had already taken place. I know we'll probably get to that later, but Paul... Yeah. Paul really didn't like uh, his teaching, and so maybe as Gary yeah. said, and as you maybe just let him go out, maybe he'll come back to the Lord. It doesn't appear that he did. Well, we need to keep moving. This is a, this is a quick trip to look at Second Timothy chapter two and look at verse four. It talks, and I guess we need to read three for background. This is good and it pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and to come to know the truth. So, uh, what is God's ultimate goal? What would he like to accomplish? Save everyone. Would he like to save even the devil? <laughs> I think he'd like to save everyone who wants to come to him, come to God, fellowship with God, love God, obey God. It, everyone who is truly repentant, and really wants to come back to God, and really wants to live a life like God, he says, welcome. I'll work with you. And he's rejected Satan's appeal at one time to come back because? It wasn't real. It wasn't genuine. Not at all. No. Well, he was, he was claiming that he would, he would just fake it, I think. Yeah. Now, he was hoping to get back and stir up more trouble in heaven. Yeah. Well, look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, 8, 9, and 10. This ought to give us another idea about what to... Um, well, let's start with verse 8. In every church service, I want the men to pray, men who are dedicated to God and can lift up their hands in prayer without anger or argument. I also want the women to be modest and sensible about their clothes and to dress properly, not with fancy hairstyles or with gold ornaments or pearls or expensive dresses, but with good deeds, as is proper for women who claim to be religious. Women should learn in silence and all humility. I do not allow them to teach or to have authority over men. They must keep quiet. <laughs> what was going on during that time to <laughs> make him say that? There must have been some powerful women saying some well, things that uh, were disruptive. Well, not only that, what else is going on? 
not powerful women, but women uh, prostitutes, basically, were the ones That's that talked. That's a lot of power. Temple okay. prostitutes. No, but he was saying wives also do not speak. Wait until you get home to ask your husband for a question. But I think it went beyond that. But yeah, but the reason was it that was talking. Yeah. Wh which women were, were, were the ones talking? Remember, he's was. he's writing to Timothy, who's in Ephesus. What do we know about Ephesus? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Temple yeah. prostitutes. Yeah. And there was this temple, uh, the temple of Diana outside of Ephesus that was, what, four times bigger than the Parthenon in Athens? I mean, and, and this place was an absolute, every evening, it was like, it was turned into basically a red light district. And that was what, I mean, in the goddess, the goddess Diana is a goddess of fertility. And that was the religious service. And that was the religious service. And Paul says, absolutely, I don't want Christian services to seem like that in any way. So we must stay as far away from that kind of behavior as we possibly can. I, I, I think there's nothing more than that. Okay? So ladies, I, I don't forbid you to speak up on TV like at this <laughs> class. Okay. Um, look at um, 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 15. What would this say about women's participation? Women should learn in silence and all humility. We've already mentioned that verse. I do not allow the teacher to have authority over men. They must keep quiet, for Adam was created first. I want you to tell me what you think of this argument. Adam was created first and then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but it was a woman who was deceived and broke God's law. But a woman will be saved through having children if she perseveres in faith and love and holiness with modesty. I would have you a hard time with would we be, Would we be better off to sort of clip that verse out of the Bible? I think we ought to clip out chapter 3 also where we were talking about the leaders in the church being perfect. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Put your black marker. Uh, what is having more children, how does it save you? you That's a job. very... <laughs> Keeps you at home, barefoot and pregnant. <laughs> I, I think probably what Paul had in mind is that uh, women who are Christians at home and good and, and Ellen White the founder of the Adventist Church said many times the most powerful argument in favor of Christianity is a, is a family a loving and well loving and lovable Christian but she also says a well-ordered ha household and I think that's probably what Paul is talking about here he says if you have a, a Christian wife who's you know and they didn't have the birth control methods that we have here today he says, if you have a Christian wife who's at home and she's taking good care of her children, they're rising, up, I mean, they're, they're growing up in the fear and honor of the Lord. That's a tremendous, uh, um, you know, testimony for the truth. She's preaching a powerful sermon. It, it, so the second phrase, <clears throat> not only that she was saved in childbearing, but go on with that. If they continue in faith, and I suppose the they is the children. Well, in faith and charity she. and holiness and sobriety? Hmm? My, my version says she, not they. That's how I read it. My version yeah. doesn't say she, but that's how I took it that way. So there's a caveat. It's not just so childbirth. Is that one of those Greek words that you can't tell what it means? Um, I don't have my Greek in front of me here. I'd have to look at that to see. Clearly, it, it must be... E either there were there's two different variations of the text, and some went one way and some went another way. The footnote says if she pers uh, perseveres or if they persevere. But it's the women. But she or they. Of course, remember the other context here is there. The, the, this was the rise of Gnosticism, which gave birth to the to the to the nuns and, and priests of the Catholic Church eventually, the idea that marriage was wrong and the idea that uh, anything, having children would be wrong and so forth, partly it's a counteraction to that. It's, I mean, a, a correction to that idea. Paul says marriage is perfectly normal. Women should do what they normally do. Uh, and that's what the place where Paul says, we Christians want to be, completely separate ourselves from the extremes on both sides of the road. Uh, what do you, how do you understand 1 Timothy 5, um, 17 and 18? 
The elders who do good work as leaders should be considered worthy of receiving double pay, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. So should we have some pastors who be receiving double pay? Well, I think that uh, it, kind of, it kind of answers itself there further down in 18, halfway, halfway through 18. Uh, I'm sorry, well, just 18. For the scripture says, Do not muzzle the ox while it is treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. In other words, they're, they're professing the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they ought to be rewarded somehow for their hard work. Don't let them starve. Um, and maybe but they should. Pay? Maybe they should. Maybe they should get triple or quadruple pay. That doesn't mean that we're going to give that to them, but maybe they should. <laughs> receive it. Often they do from people in the congregation from gifts and this and that and invite the invite the pastor out they to lunch. They do. They get a lot of there's a lot of, they, they get a lot of perks. Send them birthday presents. Mm -hmm. Little benefits. Well none of us here are pastors. Or at least is uh, double honor. Yes. Yes. As does so. a footnote in the good news. And that's yeah. really what the what the Greek says. The question is what does double honor mean? Mm -hmm. Twice as many Handshakes or twice as much clapping, or I mean, the, that's on the back. The NIV also says double Most honor. I hope so. Well, there's another verse that's raised a lot of questions in some church groups. It's found in 1 Timothy chapter 5 um, and verse 23. And it's interesting. I want to start with verse 1 to just get a flavor of what's going on here. In the presence of God and of Christ and of the holy angels, I solemnly call upon you to obey these instructions without showing any prejudice or favor to anyone. What and verse any, are you at? I'm reading uh, 1 Timothy 5. I started with verse 21. Okay. Any prejudice or favor to anyone in anything you do. Verse 22, be in no hurry to lay hands on people, to dedicate them to the Lord's service, take no part in the sins of others, keep yourself pure. And then if you drop down, the sins of some people are plain, this is verse 24, the sins of some people are plain to see and their sins go ahead of them to judgment, but the sins of others are, in, are seen only later. And the same way, good deeds are plainly seen and even those that are not so plain cannot be hidden. But right in the middle of that, all of a sudden, there's this, do not drink water only, but <laughs> take a little wine let, for, to help your digestion since you were sick so often. How did that get in there? It sounds like a personal message to one person. Okay. In the middle of a So maybe if I'm not feeling letter. so well, would that be a good prescription for me? And then, of course, the issue is, is that new wine or old wine? Mm -hmm. Well, but you it, can't tell from the Greek. The Greek word is oinos, and you can't tell whether that's, that's and that, fresh grape juice or it's slightly fermented. And that brings me back to chapter, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8. Mm -hmm. Deacons likewise are to be men worthy of respect, sincere, and here's the part, mm -hmm. not indulging in much wine. Yes. What does that mean? And further up, 1 Timothy chapter 3, and we're now looking at verse 2, a church leader must be sober, sober and self-controlled and orderly. Yeah, that's why they can only use a little bit. I see. <laughs> <laughs> then everybody else can... Just go a whole hog wild, right? I see. What are we going to do with these ver this verse? Well, there's several things to say about it. One, it, it seems that Paul was probably dictating, almost certainly was dictating to someone, and all of a sudden it came to his mind, you know, the water there in Ephesus isn't, a real, isn't very good. And Timothy, I know you're surviving there, and you, you're, you're, you've got a lot of responsibilities, and you're getting sick because you're drinking bad water. Take a little wine once in a while, and this could be pure grape juice, very likely, pure grape juice, okay? But we can't say that 100% for sure, instead of bad water. And in any case, even a slightly fermented grape juice would probably be better off than, you know, contaminated water, as far as your health is concerned. Do we know the water was contaminated in Ephesus? Yes. A lot of people were sick there. Sulfuric, sulfuric or... Um, bacteria laden. I think both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And well, the alcohol could uh, be a bit of a disinfectant yes. in the water. But you know, I heard there was there was well, like in the Middle East now, there's there's a drink that they kind of mix up from a dried powder 
that makes wine. And it's a very common thing that they give to kids, children, and everything. And I, um, I, I think it, they call it quill or something. Mm -hmm. Some, I'm, I'm not, not familiar with that. Here. I do know that in my years in Africa, uh, when they wanted to celebrate the communion, they had no way to preserve, you know, fresh grape juice to Canada or even to get it in any way. So the church would take raisins and rehydrate them, and then sort of whiz them up to make a re sort of reconstituted wine, and that was what they used for communion. Yeah. I need to look that up. So I don't they didn't do that to chewing the thing. <laughs> traditionally, <laughs> on the uh, regarding the wine with the grapes, would that regular wine would uh, grapes would turn into alcoholic wine on the eighth or the ninth day? Well, it would depend upon the temperature and it would depend upon what it was contaminated with and all lots of things. So, hmm. yeah. Bonnie thought she was going to help them out. So yeah. she, she got some real grape juice for them, you know. Yeah. They didn't want that stuff at all. Too strong? <laughs> <laughs> no, it, was, it didn't, didn't taste right. Oh, okay. That's right. They were used to mixed up raisins. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well cultures. Yeah, so so this is this is a challenge um that we face. Ellen White made this comment, tell them that is unbelievers who who invite you to their homes also that you do not use spiritist drinks of any kind because you desire to keep your mind in such a condition that God can impress it with the sacred truths of his word and that you cannot afford to weaken any of your mental and physical powers lest you should be unable to discern sacred things. Thus you can sow the seeds of truth and lead out upon the subject of keeping soul, body, and spirit in such a condition that you can understand eternal realities. That's found in the book, The Upward Look, page 342. They have groups that believe the reverse. They go and drink all kind of stuff because they want to get connected with God and other yeah. entities. Well, virtually all commentators, I'm talking about serious Bible scholars now, agree that if this is referring to alcoholic wine, it is for medicinal use only and does not refer to the social use of alcohol. And I could quote from a couple of them, this verse is often been u misused in popular exegesis as an endorsement of social drinking. The use of alcohol is strictly medicinal, and the other occurrences of wine loss wine in Paul's letters, he urges caution in its use, and many verses are mentioned. Uh, that's from the word Bible commentary. And then, water in the ancient world was impure and the carrier of diseases such as dysentery. Paul's advice to use a little wine would have helped safeguard Timothy's health from the sickness producing effects of polluted water. It was also in keeping with the medicinal use of wine in the ancient world. The Talmud, Hippocrates, Pliny, and Plutarch all speak of the value of wine in countering stomach ailments caused by impure water. That's from New International Bible Commentary on First and Second Timothy and Titus. And if you would be interested in getting some of these materials, we have study guides for each of the books of the Bible available on our website at Theological Crossroads, though that's Theox, T-H-E-O-X, dot O-R-G. And you can find these materials that we're using as a kind of outline for our discussion. Well, look at 1 Timothy 6 here, uh, verses 1 and 2. Those who are slaves must consider their masters worthy of all respect, so that no one will speak evil of the name of God and of our teaching. Slaves belonging to Christian masters must not despise them, for they are believers too. Instead, they are to serve them even better, because those who benefit from their work are believers whom they love. Shouldn't Paul have said something against slavery? This is like promoting slavery, right? It was so ubiquitous. It was a matter of fact. So he was just telling them to do the right thing as slaves, I guess. Now, was this slavery in those days based on race or anything no. like that? No. Most of the slaves, the largest percentage of the people living in the Mediterranean world in those days were slaves. 60%, maybe even more than 60% of people living in the Mediterranean world were slaves. And these slaves, some of them were very well educated and so forth. They were basically, many of them, were people who um, owed debts that they couldn't pay or something of that nature and sold themselves. Or maybe they were children whose parents had sold them into slavery to pay for debts, etc. 
So there were lots of reasons for getting into slavery that had nothing to do with race or any of the things that we think about when we think of slavery. For the longest time, I thought Jesus had been a slave. I thought from the age of 13 to 30, because usually those are the ages from 13, by, by the time they become 30, they're released. I thought mm -hmm. Jesus had been a slave, but uh, there's no way to prove or disprove something like that. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I think in that particular case about why he didn't come to the forefront with his teaching, uh, in tradition, uh, I believe a rabbi would not become a rabbi until he was 30. And that's probably Jesus was just respecting the tradition of so the time. So he just hid between 13 and 30 just for that. Something like that, yeah. Well, he was a carpenter. He worked in his dad's carpenter shop. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, didn't he didn't he say a lot of things in the the temple at the synagogues? I mean, they he asked them, yes. you know, you know me, I That's you know, when he was 12. House. From t when he was 12, between 13 and 30 there's no mention of him at all. Yeah. And well, the carpenter possibly what he meant when he I was see. talking about that. Uh, I don't know. And carpent the ca carpentry, a lot of people believe he worked with rocks. Those rocks you, mm. with olive and not really with much, with wood. So our, mm. our notion of carpentry and what he really did may have been different. That's what I read. There's a lot of things that may have been different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You think? Mm. Nobody gave us a video of Jesus yeah. working in the shop. No, I can't wait. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I can't wait. To well. Wait. It's clear, however, that slavery in the ancient world was a very different institution than the way it is, was in relatively modern times. What about 1 Timothy 6, verse 10? This is a verse that make, should all, make all of us sort of step back and think. Um, look, look, let's start from verse 6. Well, religion does make us very rich if we are satisfied with what we have. What do we bring into the world? Nothing. So then if we have food and clothes, that should be enough for us. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and are caught in the trap of many foolish and harmful desires which pull them down to ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a source of all kinds of evil. Some have been so eager to have it that they have wandered away from the faith and have broken their hearts with many sorrows. So the love of money is the root of all evil. Yes, the love of money. Okay. Money is just an instrument of trade, but it's when we love something, mm -hmm. that's where our heart is. So we should not love the money, and we should use the money for purposes of helping God's children around the world. Ellen White says, and this is from a passage from Ministry of Healing, page 211 and 212, the Bible condemns no man for being rich if he has acquired his riches honestly. Not money, but the love of money is the root of all evil. It is God who gives men power to get wealth, and in the hands of him who acts as God's steward, using his means unselfishly, wealth is a blessing, both to its possessor and to the world. But many, absorbed in their interest in worldly treasures, become insensible to the claims of God and the needs of their fellow men. They regard their wealth as a means of glorifying themselves, they add house to house, land to land, they fill their homes with luxuries, while all about them are human beings in misery and crime and disease and death. Those who thus give their lives to self-serving are developing in themselves not the attributes of God, but the attributes of the wicked one. Elsewhere, she says in Prophets and Kings, page 650, the love of money is the root of all evil. In this generation, the desire for gain is the absorbing passion. Wealth is often obtained by fraud. There are multitudes struggling with poverty, compelled to labor hard for small wages, unable to secure even the barest necessities of life. Toil and deprivation with no hope of better things make their burden heavy. Careworn and oppressed, they know not where to turn for relief. And all this so that the rich may support their extravagance or indulge their desire to hoard. That's a pretty terrible indictment. Now, well... Have you seen that happen around your house, around your neighborhood? Which particularly? Uh, people holding back their money and not helping people that can barely make make their ends meet and make, you know, barely keep alive, well, it, depends on, it depends on how big you consider my neighborhood. 
if you go from where I live a few <laughs> miles to where I work, <coughs> yes. Where I live, no. Where, where I work, yes. There are a lot of people not too far from where I live that are in desperate condition. Yeah. Ken, what, yes. do we, what unique things do we learn about God from 1 Timothy? Well, we learn several things. I, I, I'm encouraged by the fact that Nero himself, with all his power and, and, and emphasis and his corruption and all that stuff put together, cannot discourage Paul. I mean, Paul just witnesses to the gospel there in the, right in the place. He's like Nero sort of, you know, when Paul, and, and he, he appeared before Nero apparently twice during his first imprisonment, and Nero could sustain a single charge against him. He finally said, let the man go. Amazing. So, and we talked a little bit about the fire. Notice these words from Ellen White in Sketches from the Life of Paul. And now the Jews conceived the idea of seeking to fasten upon Paul the crime of instigating the burning of Rome. Not one of them were a moment believed him guilty, but they knew that such a charge made with the faintest show of possibility would seal his doom. An opportunity soon offered it offered to execute their plans at the house of a disciple in the city of Troas, Paul was again seized, and from this place he was heard away to his final imprisonment. So, and, I, and I'm encouraged by the relationship between Paul and Timothy. I mean, here are two men who had a relationship that was just, I mean, eternity will tell us the, the benefits that have derived from that relationship between Paul and Timothy. Um, I also learned something else. Paul seemed to suggest if you leave God's side, whose side are you on? Satan. You're on Satan's side. God is a God of order. That's clearly spelled out in this, in this book. Paul instructs, instructs Timothy how to organize the churches with which, to which he's been working. God has always wanted everybody to be saved. We are the ones who may frustrate his plans. But God also is a loving God, who necess which necessitates his allowing us freedom. That means that we can rebe rebel if we choose to do so. And we're going to go on in chapter, I mean, in the second letter from Paul to Timothy a little bit later. We're going to see how some of these same ideas persist in that book. We'll see you next time.